We are at an assembly plant in Bedfordshire. A completed truck rolls off this production line on average every 15 minutes. Now this rate of completion can only be kept up if there's a steady supply of parts and if each of these parts is fitted to the trucks at the right place on the line. Well, to give you some idea of the scale of the operation and of the need for good scheduling, let's just take a quick look around. A frame enters the factory and on this section of the conveyor, it is married to the axles and the wheels and tires are fitted. Next, the brake systems and prop shafts are fitted. After these have been checked, the engines are installed. The trucks are then raised to a higher level and various parts are assembled underneath the chassis. Notice that we're dealing with a continuously moving conveyor. If the conveyor were to stop for any length of time, the manufacturer would suffer an expensive loss of production. At this stage in the process, the cabs are married to the chassis and electrical and braking system connections are made between the two. After a number of further stages, the assembly is complete and the vehicles are then subjected to a number of tests. Now that was a very quick look and we've missed some important stages. However, we've seen enough to make it apparent that a lot of thought must have gone into the planning of the whole operation. Let's go back to the beginning and see how the project got started. John Pearcy has been closely concerned with product planning. John, we've been looking at your assembly line and I must say everything was going very smoothly. Now, quite obviously it must have taken a lot of planning to get things to that stage. Would you like to tell us something about that side of things? Yes, firstly I think we must appreciate that there are two distinct phases. One is the production phase that we've just seen where parts are developed, brought together to form assemblies, and these assemblies are then developed into the major units, the engines, axles, into the chassis, cabs, and eventually into a completed vehicle. Prior to this, we need to develop uh, machinery, tools, fixtures, jigs, that will produce these parts to a specification. Now, this chart here illustrates the various functions from design study through initial evaluation, management approval, financial preparation and approval, tooling through to production. This is a basic diagram, one that we could use for any commercial vehicle program and therefore forms the basis of our planning. There are one or two points I'd like to make about planning networks of this type. And I've got here a condensed version of the network you've already seen. Now, if you look at it, you first thing you notice it's made up of a sequence of arrows or directed arcs. Now each arc corresponds to an activity. It might perhaps be some phase of the planning process. At the beginning and end of each arc, we have a vertex, which in this context is called an event. It's just in a moment in time. And you'll notice that the events are numbered, and the reason is that we normally identify an activity by the numbers of the events at its beginning and end. So, for example, here, the design study would be called the activity 1030. In fact, that's the only reason why this vertex here is not identified with this one, so that, in fact, we have a different number for the activity initial evaluation. It's the event 1020. This activity here is a rather special one. It's called a dummy. It actually occupies no time at all. And in fact, the only reason for its existence is that in order to show you that this activity leads into this one. Now this event then, as you can see, is the end event not only of this activity and of this one, but also it's the beginning of this activity. Now, the sequence of activities indicates the logical sequence, or at least what's deemed to be the necessary sequence. You're not supposed to apply for management approval 
until you've completed both the design study and the initial evaluation. Well, really, that's just the basic ideas of these networks, but obviously there's a lot more to it than that. John, would you like to take us through this network? We've already spoken about the design styling study and the initial evaluation being required before we can get management approval. It is at the completion of that activity that the network splits into two separate paths, one through project preparation and financial approval, the other through detailed design and drafting, leading to initial release to the manufacturing areas and again into the tooling activity. Incidentally, this is the second use of the dummy activity. In this instance, to show the correct relationship between the activities. Now back to our tooling activity. This activity, in fact, could be broken down into a number of different networks. It covers the, all the production tooling necessary to produce that vehicle. We refer to a number of activities under the heading of tooling. Let's take a look at just one of these activities, specifically the activity of die making. This is where the ideas of the designers begin to be made ready for production. On this cubicle framework, a wooden model of the cab is set up in sections. After any necessary alterations, these models are used as patterns from which plastic moulds are taken. Using the plastic form as an aid, this ingenious machine cuts a panel form in metal for the shape of the plastic. Two forms are needed to make a die, and they are installed in this proving press. One is the master, and it's fitted at the top. The other form is fitted underneath, and is carefully matched to the master with a single thickness of metal sheet between them. This process is called spotting, and it is repeated until the two halves of the die match perfectly. Several trial pressings are then carried out and modifications have to be made before the die is finally approved for production. Well, this network covers the whole process of die making, including activities like pattern making, which we've already seen. John, would you like to explain some of the details of this diagram? Yes, so far we have talked about networks in terms of the sequence of activities that form a network diagram. Now, in this diagram, we are adding the durations of those activities, in this case, in units of days. If we were now to follow the various paths through the diagram, summing the durations of the activities, we would eventually arrive at the longest time path between the start and finish of that diagram. If one was to calculate it for this particular network, the longest time path, in fact, is through that sequence of activities. Well, that's an interesting thought. How do we set about finding a longest path? It's easy enough for a simple network, but what we really need are algorithms capable of dealing with networks of any size. Now, Norman Biggs of Royal Holloway College is going to look at this problem in mathematical terms. One of the many practical applications of graph theory is to provide a precise framework for the kind of ideas that John and Roy have been discussing. Here's one of the networks they were talking about. It's a version of the die-making network. You'll recall that the individual jobs are represented by arcs, and the relations between them are represented in a fairly natural way. Let's suppose we have three jobs, A, B, and C, and A and B must be completed before C can begin. Then they'll appear in the network like this. For example, the punch and the spotting aid must both be constructed before they can be bedded together. C 
so, in mathematical terms, we have a diagraph. The arcs of the diagraph represent jobs. Each one has associated with it a number representing the time needed for that job. The vertices of the diagraph represent events, or perhaps we should say non-events. Each one marks the end of certain jobs and the beginning of others. Well, here I've represented the problem in its diagraph form, retaining only the essential information. This time I've labelled the vertices from V1 to V9 and I've indicated the job times like this. Each arc or job will be designated by a pair of vertices VI, VJ, and we shall need to denote the time associated with it by T of VI, VJ. Also, you'll notice that the diagraph is connected, that it has just one initial vertex and just one final vertex, and that there are no directed cycles of arcs. These are obvious but very important points because unless they hold, then the algorithms that we're going to develop just won't work. Well, the first problem we're going to tackle is the one I mentioned. How do we find the longest path through a network? Now this is an important question because it will enable us to find the earliest time for completion of the entire project. So let's suppose we start then here, the event A, let's suppose we start that at day zero. Now what about the event B? Well there's only one way of getting to B, a direct route taking 26 days. So we can be quite certain that day 26 is the earliest for the event B. It won't always be quite so simple. Let's look for example at the event E. We have two ways of getting there. One via B, this is a dummy, so it's still 26 days. The other is a direct route from A, but the activity AE takes 38 days. Now you've got to be careful here. It's the longest of the two, which is going to give us the earliest for the event E, because that marks the completion not only of event AE, but also of the event BE. And so 38 days is the earliest time for the event E. If we move on now to the event F, Again, we have two possible ways of getting to F. One is via E and one is via B. And I think you can see that the longest of these is the one via E taking 43 days. So that's the earliest date for event F. Well, in this way, we can work our way forwards through the network until we reach the event Z, and that marks the completion of the entire project. In order to express that mathematically, we shall develop an algorithm to calculate these earliest times. Naturally, we shall begin at the beginning, and we decide that the earliest time that we can leave the initial vertex, V1, is zero. So we set E of V1 equal to zero. Then we shall calculate for every other vertex, VI, the quantity EVI, representing the earliest time that we can reach that vertex. When we've done that, E of VN, where Vn is the final vertex, will give us the total time needed for the entire project. Well, that's the plan. Now we must implement it. The first thing to notice is that if we need the earliest time to reach V7, then we must already know how long it takes to reach the predecessing vertices V4 and V6. So, at each stage, we shall need a little routine to find a next vertex, and it must be a vertex VI such that E of U is already defined for all the vertices U immediately preceding VI. Well, that's quite easy to achieve in practice, and we shan't bother with the details here. The important thing is the calculation of EVI. Let's look at an example. Suppose we know that it takes 38 days to reach here, and 43 days to reach here. Then clearly, it takes at least 38 plus 5 days to reach V7, and at least 43 plus 10 days to reach V7. In other words, the time required is the maximum of those two quantities. In general, E of VI will be the maximum of the earliest times EU, plus the job times T of U V I, taken over all the vertices U immediately preceding V I. 
That formula is the meat in the sandwich. Now, we can put these ideas together into a flow diagram for our algorithm. After we begin, we immediately set E of V1 equal to zero. Then, we search for a next vertex. And remember, it must be one for which E of U has already been defined for all the vertices U immediately preceding it. When we found such a vertex, VI, we calculate E of VI according to our formula. Then, we check to see if we have reached the final vertex, Vn. If not, then we must find a new next vertex and repeat the calculation. Eventually, we shall reach Vn, and then we finish. When this algorithm is applied to our simple example, we find these earliest times. And in particular, the time required for the entire project, 75 days. Well, if we can complete the project in 75 days, let's suppose we insist upon it and make that our, our goal. Does this mean then that every activity is fixed by the earliest time for its start and end events, or is there any flexibility at all? Well, let's take a look and find out. Event Z, we have now at day 75. How about the event H? Well, look at this activity HZ, we've got to subtract 12 days, and so we get down to day 63 is the latest time for that. Working backwards similarly, subtract 10, we get 53 for event G, and again, subtracting 10, we're going to get 43 for event F. No flexibility at all so far. But let's not despair. If we go to look at the event D, we subtract 5 from 53 for this activity and get 48. And now you see there is some flexibility because we have 10 days there different. If we look now at the event B, there are two ways of getting to it. One is via D, this dummy here, which would give us 38. But be careful because we have to take note of the 43 here. Subtracting 10 gives us 33. And so obviously that is the latest possible time for the event B. And actually, if you think about it, what I've actually done is to find the longest path in reverse from Z through to the event B. That's how we calculate the latest time for the event. Those ideas form the basis of a second algorithm, similar in structure to our first one, but this time we shall start at the end and work backwards. That is, we shall, first of all, decide that the latest time that we wish to reach Vn, the final vertex, is the total time required for the entire project, which we've already calculated to be E of Vn. Then, we shall calculate for every other vertex Vi, a quantity L of Vi, which is to be the latest time that we can leave Vi if the entire project is not to be delayed. Well, I'll try to explain the differences between this algorithm and the first one. This time, after we begin, we set L of Vn to be equal to E of Vn, as I've just explained. Then, we look for a next vertex. But this time, it must be a vertex for which we have already defined L of W for all the vertices W immediately following the vertex Vi. When we found such a vertex, we calculate L of Vi. Now, Roy has already explained how we do this in some particular cases, and in general, the formula is this. L of Vi is the minimum of the latest times L of W plus the job times T of Viw taken over all those vertices W which immediately follow Vi. When we've done that calculation, we check to see if we've reached the first vertex. You'll notice that this algorithm is just parallel to the first one, but it proceeds in the opposite direction. If we haven't arrived at V1, then we find a new next vertex, and we repeat the calculation. Eventually, we shall reach V1, and we finish. So now we have two algorithms, and we know both the earliest and the latest times 
associated with each vertex of the digraph. Well, I'm imagining that I've got here just one activity in some network or other, the starting event P and ending event Q, and that I've got the earliest and latest times for P and for Q. Now, what about the activity? The earliest time for actually starting it is obviously day 20 here, and the latest time for finishing it is day 60. So we've got 40 days altogether. But we only actually need 10 days, we're supposing. So we have 30 days to spare. And these 30 days are called the float time for that activity. Now, if you were to try that for some activities, you'd get a surprise. In fact, if you try it for the activity FG of our network, you find that the float is zero. There isn't any leeway here. The activity must begin at day 43 and must end at day 53. Such an activity is said to be critical. It will lie on the longest path of the network, which is also said to be a critical path. Now, a prudent manager will monitor all critical activities very carefully. And he'll do everything he can to ensure that work on the critical path proceeds on time. Formally, we shall define the float associated with an arc or job, VI, VJ, in this way. We take the latest time that it can end minus the earliest time that it can begin. This gives the time available for it. And we subtract from that the time that the job actually requires. Now, of course, the time available may actually be equal to the time needed, in which case the float is zero and we have a critical job. If for any reason that job is delayed, then the whole project won't finish on time. In this example, these are the critical jobs. In general, there will be many such jobs, but among them, there will always be at least one path from the initial to the final vertex, and this is a critical path. Well, John, we now know how to analyze a network mathematically. Can you relate this to the things that we were talking about earlier? Yes, I think the thing to realize is that although we've been dealing with a very simplified network, and we've calculated the earliest and latest occurrence times and the floats, but in practice, when dealing with an actual problem, these networks develop into thousands of activities. And it is sometimes necessary to enlist the use of a computer to actually carry out the mathematical calculations necessary on a network. Here is a sample tabulation which indicates the start and finish times of the activities. And this is the sort of tabulation that management would use in controlling projects. We've seen that planning networks are of great help in scheduling any project. And the important thing is that the mathematical techniques that we've described are capable of dealing with even the largest of such networks.